Mm-hmm. Now, hey, Jamal, I want to pronounce your last name right because I don't want to get into a fight. You know what I mean? Where, <laughs> where I know I'll lose. You know what I mean? So please tell me your last name. Charlo. Jamal <laughs> Charlo. <laughs> where I know I'll lose. You know what I mean? So please tell me your last name. Charlo. <laughs> Jamal Charlo, Charlo is on the. Earth to Keith Thurman. Come in, Keith Thurman. So uh, here's a summary of what I uh, recall from Saturday night's <coughs> excuse me card in uh, at the Hard Rock Hotel, a triple header on HBO. Shout out to Nicola Ferrari. Hope I pronounced that right. Nicola, <laughs> if I pronounced it incorrectly, I, I apologize. But um, well, here's my summary. But first of all, I'm still on fire with my picks, going back to who knows when. I mean, what am I like, 20 and two? I don't know. Anyway, now before you tell me I didn't go three and zero over the weekend, let's start with the main event. George Foreman, uh, uh, excuse me, I mean, Jared Hurd defeated Arislandi Lara by split decision. And so he's now the uh, IBF, WBA, and I believe also the um, IBO, if I'm not mistaken. Unified champion. Um, I believe he has that third belt, and I respect the IBO, and I, I consider it that um, that fifth title to go along with the WBO, WBA, WBC, and IBF. And I have my reasons for respecting that, but uh, that's another video for another time. Uh, for the record, I, I scored the fight for Ares Landy Lara 14-13, all right? That was my score. I had it 14-13. Now, I don't like using the punch stats in every fight, but I will here for educational purposes. And, and I'm not exactly going to use the numbers. I'll just go by what I recall because it's really one step. Um, yes, heard through more punches. That's not a surprise. He also landed more. However, a lot of shots he was credited for landing were actually blocked with gloves or shoulders or they may have landed but they grazed Lara but what I saw in this fight is that Arislandi Lara for the most part tapered off toward the end but he landed the better punches especially early on um, his connect percentage on power shots was extremely high I think it was 47% something like that don't quote me but it was close to 50% and I thought that was the difference in the fight even though it was a one point fight um, I think both guys made the fight more difficult than it should have been uh, Lara decided to do the one thing fans have been begging him to do for years and what happened he loses. He got in there and he mixed it up. He wasn't boring. Uh, he stood in, in the pocket. And this is what you asked for. And who would have thought Eris Landy Lara would, would be in a fight of the year candidate? Uh, <clears throat> Jared Hurd won for a couple of reasons. First of all, he did as he usually does. He kept stalking um, he was also busier 
the big thing is, and, and, and my bet is Team Lara negotiated this, was the ring size. If anyone didn't notice, that was a ex very, very small ring. And it hurt Ares Lindy Lara as well as James DeGale because both of those guys like to move. And instead of moving, in some points they had to fight in spots when they probably would have rather moved at that particular time in the fight because the ring was so small and I bet I'm telling you and it was a great job in negotiations if they did I bet team heard said that they wanted a smaller ring and Team Lara, led by Ronnie Shields, probably thought, and, and arrogantly probably thought, they didn't care about the ring size, figuring that Arislandi Lara was too skilled and too experienced for the kid. So they signed off on it. Now, George Foreman, uh, excuse me, I mean Jared Hurd, and, and, and the foreman that I'm comparing him to is the young George Foreman. Okay, not big George Foreman, but the young George Foreman, because that's what he looked like. Um, Lara's counterpunching and angles were awesome early on in, in, in the middle of the fight. Um, his hand speed and footwork were also awesome when he chose to use the footwork. The hand speed was there. Listen. George for excuse me. Jared Hurd is going to be one tough out. He's going to be a tough out. Now I mean, he'll probably get taken apart a few times when he goes to the middleweight division. Um, if there are any middleweights around by then, but for right now, it's going to take a hell of a guy to do it. Jared Hurd went to the body, and as Lara moved, he found himself going from one corner to the next. I mean, if he escaped one corner and took two steps, he was in the other corner. <laughs> I'm, I'm exaggerating there, I'm just joking, but the ring was very small, and it worked to uh, Hurd's favor. In the Later rounds, as Lara wasn't moving as much, Hurd began to hit his body. He, he hit his body at some points early on, but he really started going to work there. And the counter punching didn't come as much from Lara, and he began to pay. I was very impressed that Hurd chose to go to the jab late in the fight, which kind of set up his power shots um, two things happened here either Ronnie okay 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 Shields got out coached or Lara didn't follow the game plan meanwhile Hurd kept chopping away I mean he just walking through punches walking through listen Jared Hurd with that style He's going to get hurt. And he's not going to have a long time at the top. But until that day comes, this monster is going to be fun to watch. I don't know how he works his way down to that weight. And the IBF, I'm not I'm not sure if they exercise it. They have the option to have their champions perform a, 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 a morning of weigh-in like a same day weigh-in they do it that morning and they can't hydrate more than 10 pounds um, over the 154 pound limit in this case and uh, I don't know though <laughs> I mean that guy's a giant man I don't, I don't know how he does it 
Uh, in the fight, I loved Lara's connect percentages. Loved them. In this fight, I loved Hurd's stick to I mean, he just keeps coming. No matter what is thrown his way. It's like a... a it's like a nightmare that never ends when you're in there with him. Personally, I wouldn't mind seeing a rematch. And if they did, you assume Hurd would win the fight bigger than he did on uh, Saturday, even though I, I, I had a losing by a point. The rematch, it, it depends on the ring size and, and how old Lara really is because if he tweaks his game plan, I think Ares Landy Lara can steal the rematch. But he'd have to score bigger than what he did on Saturday night to steal it. Because usually when there's a way to eliminate the old school for the new new school, um, especially when the old school is boring and the new school is exciting, you have to dominate the rematch in order to get it. So, you're saying, well, you picked Lara. So how can you go 3-0? Well, let's go to my prediction. So before you say I went 2-1, two, two remember what I said, because it was spot on. Go back to the previous video. I said at the end of the night, my scorecard would say that Lara won, which it did. However, I also said it would be a split decision and that even though my card would say Lara they'd give the fight to Hurd which they did played out exactly that way except I thought that one judge would have like a wide score like a weirder score that did happen it happened in other fights but I, for some reason I, I just had a feeling it was going to happen but I, I, I didn't think it was going to happen in the other fights I thought it was going to happen in this one so, uh, man, whether you like Jared Hurd or not, he is must-see TV. I can't wait. I mean, there's some interesting matchups for him. Uh, speaking of, uh, I don't know if, if you saw any of the videos of Jamal Charlo all week at the press conference, at the weigh-in. When he was in the casino acting like a fool. But he wants to be next. And, and there's bad blood between the Charlo camp and Camp Hurd. This goes back to the Erickson Lubin fight where somebody got hit with a chair and then the, the two posses kind of stepped to each other a little bit in the, um, like outside the fighter area back in the uh, dressing room. So. So if Charlo and Hurd is next, look for some extra security if that fight goes down. Um, but don't be surprised if Hurd elects to fight Julian Williams first. And the reason I say that is because coming into the fight, Hurd was the IBF champion. Julian fought Nathaniel Gallimore for the IBF Eliminator. Hurd is now the IBF, IBO, and WBA guy, as I stated earlier. However, since he was IBF champion first and defended six months ago when he caught that fish, get it? When Hurd fought Trout, he he got an exception from the IBF because Trout wasn't the mandatory. It was personal. They decided to fight. Um, so somebody, in other words, took a brown paper bag, and you know the rest of the story. However, so he got an exception, but he had to agree to a mandatory to fight a mandatory before December 29th 2017 that never happened so once again 
did a brown paper bag full of something green change hands because there was some guy that someone never heard of that was the mandatory and so he got the exception and technically he got another exception now the IBF will allow a mandatory to take precedence over I'm sorry will, will allow unification to uh, they'll prioritize that over a mandatory I get that part but we're talking a few times now so did money exchange hands meanwhile Lara didn't face his mandatory either he was supposed to defend against Demetrius Andre at one point so if the IBF let it slide at least twice with her I assume they'll push for him to defend against Williams with the threat you have to negotiate the fight with Williams in X amount of days or we'll strip you one of those type deals unless he asks for another exception so he can fight Charlotte which then money will definitely change hands not necess not just for the IBF but he'll have to give Julian Williams what we call step aside money will Julian Williams play ball I kind of there's I have two two schools I have two thoughts about that I'm not going to get into it but there's an advantage for Williams to say yes or no at that point um Since Lara lost, something tells me the dreaded WBA, they are the worst, will make her the super champion and then allow Andre to fight for regular champion status. This is a joke. While most people would like to see Hurd fight Charlo, don't be surprised if we see Hurd versus Williams, like I stated, unless a nice piece of step aside money is paid to Williams. If if I was him, I'd decline. But there are advantages to declining or to take the money. And uh, there are advantages both ways. And maybe I'll make a video on that. No time here. I like Charlo's chances against her if they fight. That is the fight. I think Andre would also give her a run, but dude has been so inactive. I, I, I can envision him boxing well, getting dropped, getting stopped by Jared. Outside of Jermel Charlo, one guy I think Heard is tailor made for. And I know you guys are going to laugh at me. Is Julian Williams. I think he has the style. And all the tools. To fight the perfect fight against Herd style. He'll have to weather some major storms to do so. But. We'll see. We'll see. In the bout leading up to the main event, James DeGale won a sloppy fight over Caleb Truex. Listen, all the talk about a trilogy needs to stop. These styles, they just don't mesh. Um, DeGale needs to go back to the UK and fight for some big money. Um, maybe get a big money rematch against George Groves or, or, or if not... Uh, a fight with Chris Eubank Jr. or somebody. Um, there's 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 big money in both of those fights. Uh, DeGel got three hundred thousand dollars for his fight over the weekend, and um, but he would hit the millions if if he goes to the UK and fights George Groves. Of course, George Groves has some business he needs to take care of. The Eubank fight would be awesome too, but. DeGale wants Groves. He wants that rematch. Uh, Ares Landy Lara, by the way, made $1 million. Jared Hurd made $500,000. Uh, 
uh, Truex and the Gale made 300k a piece, and Julian Williams and Nathaniel Gallimore made $40,000 a piece. Because of the small ring, DeGale couldn't move as much as he wanted to, just like Lara. Um, I have to be honest, I, I started to doze a bit with DeGale Truex. Um, Truex isn't really anything special. Um, as in the prediction, I thought DeGale would win, but it would be much tougher than he expected. And it was, no matter what he says, and, and he knows it. Truex fought well and was in position to win the fight, but he couldn't hit the accelerator when he needed to, and, and that cost him the fight. If Caleb Truex is pushing you like he did in this fight, and he actually beat you in the fight before, it's time to think about calling it a career if you're the Gale. And that's why I say go for the big money. Neither guy really did anything special in the fight. Um, Miguel did too much holding and, and running at times. He's very fortunate he had the kind of judges he had in the home country of the champion. My thoughts are the sanctioning bodies They're, I don't think they're going to make anything with Truex and, and because they know a big fight in the UK will do 20,000 or more fans, especially if he fights Groves. So the sanctioning bodies aren't thinking rematch, they're thinking money. Not in front of like two or 3,000 at the joint at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino, where this fight card was. They're looking for 20 or 30,000, not two or 3,000, so. James DeGale, I don't think he's gonna hold the title long. I'm just not sure he has it anymore. And he needs to, he needs to go for it. Go for the big money. Um, The opening bout of the evening, Julian Williams versus uh, Nathaniel Gallimore. I, uh, I'm a little different than most fans, so this was the fight I was looking forward to the most. I just wanted to see where Julian was mentally and uh, not physically. He, he was in fantastic shape as usual. And Gallimore is the type of guy that's going to he's going to get something out of you mentally so um if you go way back to my fit video after the charlo fight versus williams i talked about a couple of technical flaws that uh julian had and, and he, he still has them um he likes to faint like he's gonna punch sometimes and he'll he'll kind of rock to the left a little bit rock to the right or whatever but when he does commit to the jab he still rocks to the left before he throws the jab and I thought that that's something Ronnie Shields picked up in the Charlo fight and and that's where the counter happened he kind of telegraphs when he's gonna throw the jab so if you go back to the second and third round in my notes, I put that Julian's still rocking to the left before throwing the jab. And they have to fix that. Um, in the third round, Julian blocked an uppercut on the inside. Awesome. He did it at least three times. And I wrote that down. And um, I, I contacted his trainer. Stephen Edwards and I, I, I sent a uh, direct message to Julian that they must have really worked on that because he blocked 
at least 20 uppercuts that came from Gallimore. I mean, it was awesome. Very disciplined in that. So, but once again, blocking the uppercut is fantastic. But showing your hand on the jab might catch up to you and ruin an opportunity defensively. Fourth round, same deal with the uppercut. Blocked it. Um, his body work started to wear Gallimore down a little bit. Um, Gallimore landed to the body, um, scored with a nice right hand, left hook, and he kind of rocked Julian a little bit. And Williams came back with a, a right hand, and the fight started to heat up after, after around the fourth. Williams, it, he looked like he started to fade a little bit in the fifth and definitely in the sixth, so he, he needed his second win. I thought he landed well to the body in the sixth round, but he didn't capitalize. I thought Showtime got it wrong. It, if you, for the opening fight, if you look at the pre-fight video that I did, um, I said that Gallimore's territory was on the inside, and he did well. But in Showtime's keys to victory, they said Gallimore should stay outside. I, I disagreed with that in my pre-fight video. If you watch Gallimore, he, he likes the inside. Um, I thought Williams started to fade in the seventh round. He started to lose his technique a little bit. He was falling forward. And whenever you see a fighter lean forward, there's one punch. One punch. That uppercut. That's what you look for. Then all of a sudden in the eighth round, you can go back to my pre-fight video. They realize he shouldn't fight Gallimore on the inside because that's Gallimore's territory. This is something I said in my video when I saw Showtime's breakdown. I'm like, nah, man. Um, I thought Williams won the seventh and eighth round despite getting a little sloppy with the technique starting to fade a little bit and then I think at the end so at the end of the eighth beginning of the ninth Williams started to get to get his second win he had a solid ninth. Gallimore on the other hand was struggling to get his second win. now he's starting to fade and Williams had him in big trouble in the ninth but he still looked a little bit gun shy so he didn't uh he didn't get him out of there. He didn't finish. Solid, another solid round. The tenth round by Williams. He threw a good mix to the head, to the body. Definitely got a strong second win now. And then a huge eleventh round. Gallimore still just, just he just never got that second win. Um, he hurt Gallimore with a left hook, and Williams began to tee off. Now, I'm probably the only person in the world who will laugh at this because most people do, probably didn't even pay attention. But as Julian Williams stalked Gallimore early in the 12th round, <laughs> he threw an uppercut. He missed Gallimore by about Gallimore by about 12 miles with that uppercut. But I, I feel what he was trying to do. I mean, he he said, "Man, let me, you know, people want to talk about me and the uppercut." And this kid is throwing uppercuts at me. Let me let me give him some of his own medicine. And uh, Williams finished strong, and, and much more impressed with the way he handled this uh, eliminator than he did the Joshua Conley fight, and most certainly the uh, fight with Ishe Smith, which I really didn't think he looked good. I mean, but he he looked fantastic in this fight. So he'll go back to the drawing board. He'll get ready for his shot more than likely. So uh, there you have it. Um, a few other observations I made during the fight. <laughs> you know, it was a bad night at the office for the Birds. Robert Bird needs to retire. Um, he's just been making bad decisions as a referee for a while now. 
and he made a couple bad calls in the fight that he refereed. First, with ruling a cut caused by a punch when it was clearly a headbutt. Also, uh, the point deduction that he that he uh, issued to uh, James DeGale. Fortunately, DeGale was up on the cards, and he, he <laughs> they got the bleeding stopped enough because it was a mess for him to continue. Because if they would have ruled it a punch, then and and then the fight stops. Well, uh, Truax wins. And then the point deduction didn't come back to haunt him either. That's why the New Jersey Athletic Control Board, which is what they call their boxing commission, the New Jersey Athletic Control Board, is the best in the business. Not only do they use instant replay so that referees can get the calls right, but if you are crooked, like the judges in the Lara versus Paul Williams fight, you get suspended. They got suspended. Now check it out. That fight was July 9th, 2011. Judge number one, Hilton Whitaker, had it 115-114 for Williams. No way. He didn't judge another fight until October 13th, 2012. That's over one year where Larry Hazard sat him down. Judge number two, Al Bennett, didn't judge again until October 25th, 2014. That's over three years, all right? And finally, judge number three, Donald Givens, didn't judge again until June 25th, 2015. That's four years. New Jersey doesn't play, and, and, and Larry Hazard doesn't play. It's the only state using instant replay, so proper calls are made. And, and referees get the same treatment as judges. If they screw up or if they make questionable calls where it looks like they might have took a payment under the table, if Larry Hazard determines that that could be the case, he'll sit the judges. He'll sit the referee. Now, big fights, big, big fights don't come to Atlantic City anymore. They, don't, they, just, they just don't come to AC. Not because the boardwalk is going down. Actually, with the, the outlets that they've added off the boardwalk, they get plenty of traffic. And they still have some of the best shows and concerts around the world. The problem is, these con men who float around in boxing don't want to go anywhere where there's a strong commission. That's not on the take. New Jersey is number one, and it ain't even close, folks. Back to the birds. Next up is Robert Bird's wife. Yeah, she's at it again. Adelaide Bird's scorecard for the Sergio Mora versus Alfredo Angulo fight was grossly off the mark. Two judges had it 78-74 for Mora. Bird had it 77-75 for Angulo. And so that's a big swing for an eight-round fight. Big swing for an eight-rounder. No, no further comment on the birds. I'm going to leave them alone. They need to fly away though. Lastly, I recall really enjoying uh, listening to the fight card without Mauro Ronaldo and his much rehearsed analogies and his cutting off of Paulie and Al Bernstein when they're talking. You gave me Barry Tompkins, Bernstein, Farhood, and Malinaji, and I tell you what, they did a superb job. If you can just let Mauro Ronaldo stay with the pro wrestling, and I, I tell you, they call him the voice of Showtime Boxing, and I know Al Bernstein and Paulie. I, I, every time they hear that, Brian Custer. Okay, let's talk to the voice of Showtime Boxing. I'm like, oh god, man, I, I, that has to make guys who've been in the business for years commentating. It has to make them sick to their stomach. 
Uh, look for the WBA to do the same thing to Anthony Joshua that maybe the IBF does to Jared Hurd or, or even the WBA. They'll threaten to strip him if he doesn't face his mandatory. Now, what the WBA needs to do, which, uh, in this case, it, it, his, uh, Joshua's mandatory would be um, Pavekin. Yeah, I mean, you see how that went full circle? Like, Pavekin was supposed to be Wilder's mandatory, and then shenanigans happen, and all of a sudden he's AJ's mandatory. It's like, wow. Um, the WBA needs to focus on the fact that if AJ and Wilder unify, unify They'll get a big payoff in sanctioning fees from both guys. <sighs> Stay tuned. All right, I'm almost done. Just one more thing. Paging Keith Thurman. Come in, Keith Thurman. I'm out of here. <laughs>